This episode was recorded before April 1st, 2022, when Danielle Smith announced her candidacy for the United Conservative Party of Alberta. Welcome to Danielle Smith's Razor Forum. This program is part of a series of podcasts doing in-depth interviews on free enterprise and personal liberty. I'm your host, Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. Go to fraserforum.org where you can subscribe, comment on the program, and see links to the studies we discuss. You will also find archives of previous episodes. Our email address is danielle at fraserforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. 17 months of negotiations. The Prime Minister of Canada left the table and said, I can't deal with you guys anymore. You got 20 items on the table, we're down to 15 or whatever. We can't get a deal here. And uh, therefore, I'm not uh, I'm not being part of this any longer. I can do this unilaterally. Now, this is the point where most Canadians have no idea whatsoever. Hi, I'm Danielle Smith. Welcome to another edition of Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. I'm delighted today to be getting a bit of a walk through history with the last living signatory to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He's gone to the Supreme Court twice. He's on his way to a third trip to the Supreme Court. He's going to tell us all about that. I'm talking about none other than Brian Peckford, who's the former Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador from the years 1979 to 1989. And he joins me now. Brian, thanks so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, I, I want to... I think there's going to be a lot that we can talk about, about how our constitution works, how our charter of rights and freedoms works, how none of it is really working particularly well for the citizens or for the provinces. But I, I do want to, to delve into a bit of the, the history of Newfoundland and Labrador, if you don't mind, because I, I know that there are other provinces who feel a bit aggrieved about how the country works. And when I read through the way in which uh, your your home province has been treated, you you have the, the, the bragging rights for the most aggrieved province in confederation. And I, I just need to understand how some of that happened because uh, Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada late in 1949. And I wonder if uh, that vote was held today, whether the Newfoundlanders <laughs> would have made the same choice. So, so maybe take us back and give us a bit of a history lesson. What, what, what was happening in 1949 that, that caused Newfoundlanders to, to decide that they wanted to be part of the Confederation of Canada? And what happened uh, happened in the 30s, in the dirty 30s during the Depression time. Our bonds were called, and we were a dominion of Newfoundland and Labrador, like the Dominion of Canada, like Australia, like New Zealand. But uh, they wouldn't be called today, but they were then. Uh, and it's a good, good question as to why they were called then. There's a lot of conspiracy theories on the go, but the net, but bottom line was that we sort of lost our status and became again, a ward of England, if you will, and commission a government. So uh, we, we dissolved our legislature and we were run by a commission of government from 1933 to 1948, at which time um, the Canadian and British governments <clears throat> um, through one means or another uh, and through their appointees in Newfoundland on the commission of government, thought it was uh, opportune to perhaps start looking towards uh, confederation with Canada. You know, we've been around here, says England, a, a while, and now we are commissioned a government, and while we still have certain obligations to you, perhaps it might be better for you to mm -hmm. be with the uh, easternmost province of Canada rather than being a colony of Britain and you're wanting to perhaps get back and be a dominion status again. So referendums were held. And the first one was, uh, had three on it. Uh, one was Canada, one was go back to being a, a separate state, like we were from, 90, from 1832 to 1932, okay, um, 100 years. We were a dominion, if you will, had our own representative government and all that. And the third one was economic union with the United States, which was advocated by the time by John Crosby's father. He, he, was the, he was the proponent of economic union with the United States. That got dropped off the ballot in the first go around. And so it was left between confederation or going back to being an independent state. And 51 to 49, it came out to be a uh, the province of Canada or to join Canada. Uh, quite a few people around read, written a lot of books about uh, whether in fact uh, that was a legitimate vote or not. And uh, there's 
seems to be a fair amount of uh, data around indicating that there was a fair amount of conspiracy between the two senior levels of government, Canada and, uh, and Britain. And here we have it. And now we've been a province this long. I can, was, can, Brian, can I just get you to, to, uh, to address the issue of economic union with the states? Did it drop off because there was no appetite for it? Or is it what you're alluding to, that it was not perceived to be the ideal option for either the Dominion of Canada or for, uh, for, the, for, for Great Britain? Uh, yeah. do, you think, do you think Newfoundlanders would have gone for that? No, I don't think so. But there was a, a, a residue and still is in Newfoundland of, of uh, pro-American feeling because of the uh, American bases that were established during the Second World War. One in Happy Valley Goose Bay, huge Air Force base, one of the largest naval bases in Argentia, and another Air Force base in Stephenville. And they employed during the Depression, and just after the Depression was over, and the war started in 39, 40, 41, the building of those bases was a, one of the greatest economic booms that uh, Newfoundland had ever seen. And the Americans treated Newfoundlanders very, very well. Uh, to the point where they were paid the same, had the same health insurance and all the rest of it as Americans did. And so there was a residue uh, feeling of, uh, of a positive feeling towards the United States of America as a result of that. And I think Chess Crosby, John's father, was building on the idea of being a, 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 a businessman himself, was building off the idea of trade uh, with the United States we had done a reciprocity agreement in 1901, 1902, by one of the best premiers, uh, first ministers Newfoundland ever had, a fellow by the name of Sir Robert Bond, and he didn't last all that long, but as long as he lasted, he, he did try to bring some uh, integrity to the administration of justice and, and government in Newfoundland. And so we, we had a lot of ties with the Boston states, as they were called in Newfoundland terms, as did the Maritimers. But we had a special bond with Boston and New York and helped build the two cities from tradesmen from Newfoundland. And there were Newfie clubs in uh, New York and, and uh, Boston for many years, right up until a few years ago, uh, of uh, Newfoundlanders who went and stayed in New York and Boston. And so, uh, yeah, so there was this residue of uh, goodwill towards the Americans when the whole business of what are we going to do with our future came up in 48, 49. It must have been a pretty good pitch, though, that the Dominion of Canada would have made, because otherwise, why would Newfoundland and Labrador have joined? I don't know if any of the promises made ended up panning out, because it, it, it does seem to me like so much of the industry of Newfoundland well, and Labrador. What happened, yeah, we lost all of our industry by joining Canada. All of our local craftspeople, our cabinet makers, or you name it, you know, all of that was local to Newfoundland was lost and manufacturing in, in St. John's area was lost. But uh, uh, one of the things that uh, put it over the top was the old age pension, uh, you know, um, baby bonuses was called at the time, family allowances and so on. Because coming out of the depression into the, the, the 40, the 30, you know, 30s where we lost our nationhood, if you will, and then came on the commission of government, there were pretty tough times in Newfoundland. And so any promise of getting every month a check in the mail because of your age, uh, either being young or old, family allowance or old age pension was a huge, huge attraction. And I, I suspect that's why I put it over the top. And also with a very eloquent um, um, promoter, Joey Smallwood at the time, who became the first premier. So that's a little bit of the, the history of it. But uh, it was a very hard fought. Uh, I was seven years old at the time of Confederation. And so I was born a Newfoundlander and, uh, and not a Canadian. And I tell the people that now and here I'm out defending the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada more than perhaps a lot of Canadians are that I know uh, and who are who are familiar with the Constitution like me, but who don't don't preach as strongly about Canada as I do. So I come come by it by choice, not not by uh, not by birth. But uh, yeah. And the other thing, the terms of union with Canada were bad, were, were not good terms for for Canada. We gave away our fishery, for example. In the exactly. system, of Alberta giving away its oil, it was you know equivalent at the time, and uh, I, I've always been known as a closet nationalist. From the day I became leader of the PC party in Newfoundland in '79, a lot of people uh, classified me primarily because I was really upset as a as a student and of history uh, through university and getting involved in university politics and then understanding our our position as a, as a province 
I may have, Brian, if I may, I, when, I you, when, you, Newfoundlander, you know. when you use the term nationalist, you mean like a put Newfoundland for interest first, not not a federalist. Is that how you're using the term nationalist, that you put your I'm, province I'm, first? I'm using it even more in the terms that at Confederation, we should have remained a separate state. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah Look, and, uh, Let's talk about, I want to talk about these three issues because I, I think it does sort of, it, it is ironic that you're now becoming the champion of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms with this history that, that we're, we're exploring. But t tell me what happened with the fisheries because uh, I think that there's this perspective out West is that it was mismanaged, but now that you're saying that it was the federal government who took over the management of it, let's make sure that we're placing blame in the, in the right spot. It sounds like in the 80s, uh, you, you, so 1985 sounds like a pretty key decision that ultimately led to the to the collapse of the of the fish stocks in 1992 and the closure of the fishery. But to, to remind us of that history, what happened? Well, it, it, it's still really there was a royal commission by the former uh, president of the university held uh, on that whole business, whatever happened to the cod stocks, and there was no clear clear conclusions coming out of it. Uh, I think. That, that you hit part of it when you talked about, we really lost the fishery when it went to the federal government. How you, could you manage a, an Atlantic fishery from the Rideau Canal um, um, boggles the mind. Uh, and uh, so I think there was this, um, uh, it was wrong right from the beginning, okay? Now, um, after say, saying that, uh, there were a lot of decisions that were made then for the first couple of decades where Newfoundland had very little input. And then in the 80s, uh, well, like starting in 72 with Frank Moores, the premier who had been an MP and then came back and ran for the conservative leadership and became the leader, the premier before me uh, or me after him. And uh, uh, he began with some of us to initiate talks with the federal government to say, we don't, we're not putting up with this anymore. And we want some say in the management of our fishery. We were only very partially successful and perhaps not at all. And they were still trading fish to other countries uh, for other things in mainland Canada, which we had no say over. So it, 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 it was a real disaster. And then, um, of course, in the trawlers got involved and there were still some fishing rights by Spain, Portugal and Eastern Europeans. So there was a lot of fishing going on offshore from foreigners at the same time as we were fishing, fishing inshore. Then we started to move offshore with trawlers and fish plants which overall um, may be uh, in history, not the right, proper route to go in the sense of the trawlers and the way they were dragging the bottom of the ocean. So finally Canadians and the foreigners got in on dragging the bottom of the ocean, which was where of course a lot of the fish were spawning. But add to that, and this is what a lot of Canadians don't know, is that when we did the 200 mile limit internationally, to say that the, uh, the uh, coastal state had jurisdiction, if you will, over fisheries out 200 miles. One of the few places in the world, I think the only place in the world that has a continental shelf beyond 200 miles and on which fishing occurs is off Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's called, uh, because of its shape on the continental shelf, the nose and tail of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, okay? Now, most people, when they're describing this to you, who are Canadians and even most Newfoundlanders would never say the nose and tail. They would use some more colorful description, more uh, politically correct wording, uh, which I detest. And as you can tell, and therefore I deliberately use nose and tail of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland because that was the shape of the continental shelf beyond 200 miles. That's where a lot of the spawning for a lot of the lucrative northern cod occur, as well as other ground fish like flounder, right? And, and other white fish, other white ground fish. And then they swam, as I told Prime Minister Trudeau one time, Daddy Trudeau, Papa Trudeau, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, in a national conference when he talked about, uh, he said to me, uh, in, uh, that, uh, you know, why was I arguing for more say over the fishery? Because fish swim. In other words, they were international. Only thing is he didn't know his fishery very well because those fish swam from offshore Newfoundland to inshore Newfoundland. They didn't swim into international waters. They swam inshore. There is an, a genetic uh, makeup of the northern codfish, which were sw swims from 
offshore to inshore, it's chasing the capelum, which is their feed, the smaller fish, like a, like a small herring, and they're called capelum, and they were the main feedstock with the squid for, for codfish, okay? And so um, we had, therefore, a pressure on the fishery from both offshore, hmm. the, the foreigners, and then from our own uh, um, indigenous, if you will, or native fishery as we move from just storing the fish in our stages like my grandfather did to giving to selling it to a company that had a fish plant that processed it immediately right and so we went from salting our fish to having our fish go to a fish plant so we went from a salt fish trade to a fresh fish trade and of course more and more fish plants meant more and more fish and therefore the pressure on the uh, on the resorts got got to be too much and it, it collapsed so it was partly by our own hand, and I always say this, and I'm one of the few in Newfoundland will say this, but even to this day, it was partly by our own hand, but it was a collection of, uh, of, of things, including we had very little say, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Fisheries Organization, which was Spain and Portugal and Bulgaria and Germany and so on, the UK all came over with their, their factory freezer crawlers in the later times <clears throat> and fished on that nose and tail which was exactly where the fish was spawning. So it was just really a question of time when you look at it in history, that the pressure was just too great and that, that the um, that wonderful cod resource was gonna collapse and is still in trouble today, even after 92 to 2022, it has not recovered uh, to the point where you could get back to a commercial fishery on the Northeast coast of Newfoundland. And therefore- That's re it's really remarkable, 30 years and it hasn't been able yeah. to recover. Now we do remember, again, you'll have to remind me of the circumstances. I thought Newfoundland and Labrador scored a victory with uh, former premier Brian Tobin when they got involved in the turbot wars with the Spanish. Did, was there some victory made on that no. nose and tail? Did we end no, up no, ever that, getting- that, that, that's, a, that? that's, a, that's another Newfoundlander who it was very good with words like me and a lot of us who had come from Newfoundland, very oral, oral tradition. But the, the horse had already left the barn and barn doors closed, but nobody in central Canada knew. The turbot was not a big fish in Newfoundland, never was, isn't today. Okay, So this was just a Brian Tobin PR exercise that I tried to point out at the time, but was smothered by all those central Canadian press who loved the fact that you know he got up there with this... Uh, great graphic display and it wasn't a victory at all it was a it was a, it was a, a, a an embarrassment to those of us in Newfoundland who knew the fishery do, do you ever do you know what would what it would take now for the the stocks to recover I mean when I was at the Fraser Institute as an intern my boss at the time was uh was Laura Jones who did a, a did work on the salmon fishery because the salmon fishery in BC was under stress and we looked at places around the world where they would have quota systems so that you could get an underlying measure of the stocks, identify what you reasonably would be able to harvest without impacting the level of the stocks, and then have an auction type of system so that each people, each person got their share as a way of trying to manage the commons. Is Are we too far gone with, with how, how much overfishing there was? Or do you have some thoughts on how it could be recovered? Well, the lobster fishery, the shell fishery, and the crab fishery in Newfoundland, lobster fishery has worked very well that way. Of course, it's not, a, it's, it's not an open system. It, it, it goes from license from, from family to family, right? You know, if you got a license, then it goes to your, it's that way, but it is managed on their quota and has uh, been highly successful in, in Newfoundland and the bays in Newfoundland where they still, you know, where, where, where lobster fishing is, is uh, lucrative and commercial. So it can be done in the crab fishery. It, it's a sort of a speckle, um, speckle. it's sort of a spotty, spotty history on that score as relates to management. And I think that's a, a little more complex because of the, there's beds of crab off Labrador and there's beds of crab off different parts of Newfoundland. And I think there are other factors at play there, but as it relates to the, um, the, uh, the lobster fishery it has worked very well. And uh, unfortunately we were too late in reforming the system because you couldn't get anybody to look at it. And, and I got documents here right in front of me right now. I, I've kept them all right down here by my bookshelf where all of the where, uh, presentations that I made to the federal government while I was premier on the fishery and got no answer. It's, it's, um, it, 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 it saddens me to no end, okay? I, you hit a very sore spot here, a really tender spot with me uh, as it relates to the fishery. And um, um, I, uh, I, I just, of all the stuff that I did for 10 years and came to naught, 
and um, it's very, very, very sad. And the other problem was that as we were progressing as a people, as a province, we uh, Smallwood denigrated the fishery. That was the other problem we had after we joined Confederation. That's why he gave it away. He denigrated the fishery and, and had almost 20 years of industrialized our parish. I have his book here, which says that, which nobody wants to talk about anymore either. Uh, but uh, and so we were we were uh, trying to get off the fishery, if anything, for a number of years, instead of trying to get some of the say back with the federal government and manage it properly. And, and uh, I remember as a young social worker in, in, in rural Newfoundland, where when I uh, come as an 18 or 19 year old to relieve the permanent welfare officer in an isolated part of Newfoundland, and the lady would say to me, uh, um, you know, she, she would try to hide away that she had fish huh. and, and say, would I like a tin of meat? And I would sit, there, sit her down and say, lady, I want to tell you something. I'm only 18 years old. I'm only 19 years old. But don't you dare look down upon your fish. Don't dare look down upon your fishery and what your husband is doing to make a living. This is a very, very honorable occupation. It's as good as any occupation in the world. That's one of the things that got me into politics because of that kind of inferiority that we were having towards who we were and what we were doing as a people, right? And I tried to change that around by introducing our own flag. And every time I go anywhere, making sure that they sang God Guard the Newfoundland or Ode to Newfoundland, I wouldn't go into an audience unless they sang it. That was one of my conditions. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about well, you know, I hate to bring up uh, old wounds, but that's only one of three old wounds I want to talk to you about, because you mentioned Joey Smallwood. And when I look through history, I think there must be no one who's negotiated a worse contract than the Churchill Falls contract. I, I was recently in Panama, and I, I saw that the Pana, Panamanians initially negotiated for the Panama Canal. They gave the United States the um, the so sovereignty over the canal in perpetuity, five miles on either side with the token amount of $250,000 a year. My first thought was, hmm, I wonder if Joey Smallwood negotiated that deal on behalf of Panama. Yeah. So tell yeah. us what happened with Churchill Falls. It makes no, it makes no sense to me that, no. that, that so much of the, of the wealth associated with that does not generate a, or benefit Newfoundland at all. Exactly. Uh, several studies have been done over the years, and I think the first study had the amount of economic rent we were losing was, in those days, $400 million a year. And that would have been more than the equalization that we were getting from Canada at the time when we would have been a half province just by getting a reasonable deal, not even a, you know, not even a market thing uh, the, at the time. We would have been getting uh, $400 million a year. That went to $800 million a year. Today, I would say it's you know, a billion, billion two, billion four that we're losing every year in economic rent. In other words, the amount that we would get if we were getting market rates versus what we're getting, right? Um, so can I, can I tell you how I understand this? $2, then, $2 you, a barrel oil. Oh, so, okay, I want, I want to tell you how I understand this. And you tell me if my, if my conception of this is right, is that the only way for this resource for hydroelectric power to be developed and the, the, is the whole of the resource in Newfoundland and Labrador, but you needed permission from Quebec to put a transmission line through so that you could get to the, the more populated markets. And essentially right. you were held to ransom. It was, at, yeah, we can we'll point, let you go we were, through, but uh, we, we're essentially gonna take all the profit out of at it. At that point we were, because it was too difficult, to, too more expensive to bring it down to Southern Labrador across the Newfoundland, down the south, the west coast of Newfoundland and over to Nova Scotia. They're doing it now on, with the Muskrat Falls, but which is another disaster. Not because we were, not because we were stranded, but because we, did, we made a bad deal. But we also made a bad deal on the upper, even if we were stranded, even if we needed Quebec. That was just a bad deal. It should never have been signed in the first place. Smallwood was industrialized or perish. There was going to be his big legacy, like unfortunately Danny Williams saw it with the Muskrat Falls, and, and he failed too. And so there's, there's lots of, lots of so-called legacies that go on around the Newfoundland history by our own hand, by our own hand, by Newfoundlanders, by people who were born in Newfoundland, raised and educated in Newfoundland too, being the ones I just mentioned. And so what happened was Smallwood got, uh, got infatuated with the industrialists. He used to go to London a lot. He, he, you know, he, he'd stay in the best hotels over there. And uh, so he became enamored with this and he became enamored with, of course, uh, this fantastic resource, 5,000 megawatts in one spot, right? 5,000 megawatts, 5,280 megawatts in one spot. And, and that was the Churchill River, the upper Churchill River. Uh, 
And I don't think I'm trying to think in context in Canada, in Alberta, we have, I think, a total of about 15,000 megawatts of installed capacity. But I'm thinking that our largest plants are our coal plants in the order of 1000 megawatts or more. So you're talking about five times what a typical plant would be in Alberta, just to, I'm trying to put it. In you, scale. I'm glad you mentioned it's good for you. Good for you. I compliment you in knowing your uh, knowing your uh, your economics like that, because very few people do. You're one of the few that has ever interviewed me who could uh, come back with that kind of re response. In Quebec, I think there may be one or two sites which may be larger than 5,000. Mm. But outside of that, you're right. In all of the provinces of Canada, generally speaking, uh, you know, most of your, your even hydro plants would be anywhere from, you know, 500 to 2,000, right? In Manitoba, two or 3,000. So here it was huge resource and, and, and Smallwood was taken by, by Brinko and by the Quebec uh, people and uh, negotiated this terrible deal, which saw us getting um, for 40 years, getting about $2 a barrel for uh, oil equivalent and then going down for the last 25 years. <gasps> On less what? Than $2 a barrel. So this so, is what I don't understand. So it's, it's tough because I think in terms of price per kilowatt hour. So yeah. when on some of our long-term coal plants, we were able to have prices in the order of three cents per kilowatt hour. And I thought that essentially that was what was negotiated with Quebec. Um, no. But but no, tell, so tell, that was so, 35 cents in, in, in 3.5 mils per kilowatt hour. And then it went down. Like, what were they thinking would happen? Did they not have inflation back in 1969? When, when, when I entered the legislature for the first time, my first speech in it, I said the Greeks knew about inflation. And I was talking about the Upper Churchill. And uh, it was late one night, I remember, I got, I got to get up and be recognized by the speaker. And uh, so I, that was in my craw from the time I knew about it as a student at university until I became... Uh, premier and yeah i mean one has just got to buy there's no uh, there's no plausible explanation for negotiating that kind of a deal and then of course to negotiate it for 335 mils per kilowatt 3.5 mils per kilowatt hour for 40 years and then for it to go down for the last 25 i mean this is the, the this is the real kicker to it all again no inflation anywhere in it and so yeah and then of course to come along now and just in the last in, since i moved here to bc uh, you know, for our province to once again go to the lower part of that same river and Muskrat Falls being another development that could happen of uh, six, 700 megawatts of power. Um, that quite small then by comparison. That by comparison, yeah. But of course the prices had gone crazy and now you could do and link up with and, and have it come through Nova Scotia. But Nova Scotia is getting power cheaper out of Muskrat Falls and Newfoundland is. That's how bad that deal is. A second bad deal. You know what? Quebec, Quebec, Quebec got the first good deal. Nova Scotia gets the second best deal. Do you know what's you know what the real problem for me is? Is that it's I think it's destabilizing to the to the federation. Not only because it's such obvious unfairness about one province the way they're being treated, it also shows the ineptitude or you know, I don't know if it's ineptitude or if it's the the inability of the federal government to intercede on your behalf to make sure you got a fair deal. No, we can nod. Wink and nod, Danielle. It's the wink and nod. It's worked. I mean, I remember when I went to Ottawa the first time and thereafter, what the federal government did at the time was ignore hmm. Newfoundland's plight as related to that. Uh, one or two of them said, uh, I'll, I'll talk to Rennie or I'll talk to Barassa, right? That's all they would ever do, right? Uh, even, uh, you know, even those of my own party. That's all they would, that's all Mulroney would do or Crosby or any of them would do. And so it was left, and so it was left to me uh, because nobody else did it up to me to uh, actually challenge it in the court. I challenged the lease first. There was a lease to it. And I said, when it was economic and feasible to do so, Newfoundland could, right, be involved in seeing that lease change. But of course, Supreme Court of Canada, we were problems of Canada, you know, you can't break up the, you know, the, the international, uh, interprovincial trade, which is federal. And therefore this over, this, this trumps, uh, right, this lease thing, okay? And then I went and I, I got a team of lawyers from all over the world, the best lawyers from all over the world who are familiar with uh, provincial, right, federal dominion status kind of stuff and all that. 
Uh, plus, we're familiar with contracts. People from um, Australia, people from Edinburgh, professor at Edinburgh, professors from University of the United States, all over. And they came up with a team of, uh, with a, an idea that a team of lawyers in Newfoundland had sort of suggested, which was, but the Lord giveth, the Lord can take away. And so I did the Water Reversion Act and went to the Supreme Court of Canada, of course, once again, being part of Canada, uh, you know, you couldn't do this kind of stuff anymore. And therefore we lost the game. And so I did everything to try to change that. And, and, and then for, for another premier, to, subsequent premier to come along and do a like kind of deal uh, on, the, on the lower Churchill, it's just like, um, you know, yeah, you're hitting me when I'm down and now you're oh. hitting me. Mm, well, tell so. me about, but I'll, I'll tell you one more reason why I think it's destabilizing to Confederation is because it's created a false reality for Quebecers. They now think that electricity is free and they think everybody else should be able to phase out of their various energy sources, whether it's nuclear, whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's coal, natural gas, um, because they don't pay the market rate for electricity. So they don't really have a real perspective on how much electricity costs the rest of us. I tell you, you hit the nail right on the head again, because uh, I've spent a lot of time in Quebec over the years, both both when I was in politics and out, out of politics, and I, I understand the place, I think, a bit better than a lot of others. I didn't ignore it. I went to it, you know, both as a citizen and as a politician, and talked to a lot of people there. And you're dead right. There is, you just get outside of uh, the corporate world of downtown uh, Montreal, and anywhere else in the province. And they have exactly that mentality as it relates to power and their place in confederation. And they just don't understand why all of these people are burning fossil fuels uh, and uh, you know how, how dangerous that is to the environment. And it has prevented, as you said, uh, Quebec has prevented you know, Energy East pipeline from going ahead and, and other light pipelines. Uh, and it's been very divisive to a, a cohesive uh, confederation. Completely. So 2041 is when this contract comes to an end. And uh, boy, I still hope you're here to, to offer your perspective on that as we get close to the negotiations. But but what happens then? I mean, presumably, it there goes will back be... to square one and, and Newfoundland has a real opportunity to negotiate a fair deal for the first time in its life on, on hydro matters. And uh, hopefully they're going to be up to the up to the challenge. Uh, no doubt, uh, knowing Quebec, they'll want to start negotiations in uh, in thirty one, and uh, they, they they I would not doubt for one minute that there's uh, scenarios being developed in Hydro Quebec this day to to, to uh, be a, uh, to be operative, right? When they start negotiations, they're that they're that sharp right, when it comes to the, these things, and uh, they're going to be ready to put up a to mount something. And uh, I hope Newfoundland is ready. Well, um, tell me, what would you do? What do you think the, the deal oh, should I be? Would just, I would just stop it completely. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and, and just put on the table. Here, here are market prices today. And uh, th there's the floor. And here's, here's the inflation thing. And, and uh, we're going to do it for uh, perhaps five, perhaps 10 years with a renewal in there to be reopened at that time and see where we are at that time. So there, there would be that kind of a, a deal. Uh, I would not. I mean, I refused to, to develop the Lower Churchill on principle. That was my, um, and when Clyde Wells came in, I remember him, I think he, he had somebody call me about it. It's funny, all of these uh, premiers that came after me, none, none of them will call me and ask me what I think. Regardless, they can take it and throw it in the waste paper basket. They, you know, it could be verbal. It doesn't have to be even recorded. And they could just ask me what I think, but none of them did so. Um, it was really weird, especially when I'm the person who, who, you know, the, uh, negotiated the Atlantic Accord when everybody in Newfoundland near the end said, you tried your best to uh, get the Nova Scotia deal and we'll forget the Atlantic Accord. Um, and that deal has stood the test of time with about almost $30 billion cash gone to Newfoundland because of the Atlantic Accord, because we got royalties, the same as if the oil was on land. That's what I was fighting for. It's really funny that they, they don't uh, turn around and at least say, well, what do, you, what do you think about A, B, or C? But I, my, 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 my position was nothing until the upper opens. I will not even negotiate anything on the Churchill Falls unless you're willing to open the upper as part of it. It had to be a Churchill deal, a full Churchill River deal, not breaking it up into parts where you can nickel and dime us to death. So that was, that was the policy until I left. It changed right after I left. 
Mm. It changed. Where governments were prepared to talk to Quebec about the lower Churchill with no reference to all of these decades still left on a crazy deal. Oh my goodness. Well, you know what? I'm going to be watching that. Thank you for letting me know that the time horizon is actually a, a little bit closer than I anticipated because I'll be, I'll, I'll make sure. And I, I, I wish Newfoundland and Labrador would develop a partnership with some of the other provinces who also share concerns about maintaining resource autonomy, because I, I think that there would be some friendships and partnerships on that. So that's on my radar. Um, I, I, did, I, I did with Lahi. I did with Lahi. Well, smart. We, 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 actually, we actually borrowed from the Heritage Fund. Really? Yes. To, to, to On what? To make Hibernia happen? No, no. Just our general borrowing each year, right? Because it was easier to do it in Canada if we could, rather than have to do, do it in foreign markets. And I, we developed a relationship where, where Alberta said one day to me, uh, we were thinking about it, and they said one day to me, you know, if you, you want to borrow some money, well, you can borrow some money from us. We're, we're only too happy to sit down and negotiate. And they yeah, did. So they did. And so that you're not hamstrung, so that you actually have another option when you have to go to the markets. Exactly. The only other problems we had any kind of a partnership with, and I'm glad you brought that up once again, these are new concepts that a lot of people have. Oh, God, it's, it's gone by the wayside. With Prince Edward Island of all places, we had a partnership with Prince Edward Island where we helped them with the forestry that they were trying to, to build up on the western side of the island of being uh, very small, but they still wanted to get more trees. We wanted to develop more agriculture in those small areas of the province where we could still, you know, we had root crops and stuff growing and where we could learn from them. So we had a partnership with PEI when Angus McLean was the premier of, um, of PEI. So this business of, mm. of, of provincial partnerships is something that I am very strong on and I don't understand why the province is not doing more of it. I really don't understand it. I just don't understand it. We get tied up with our own liquor licensing and they're tied up with our own trucking rules and some other ridiculous stuff. Meanwhile, all the big issues, <laughs> resource issues, where our revenue comes from, what keeps us alive, are, not, are, are ignored. Well, let's talk about the Atlantic Court because you just mentioned I was thinking that that was one more fight that didn't go Newfoundland and Labrador's way, but it sounds like it did go your way. And I'm wondering how got, you won that control. one. Oh, yeah, we won that one. We won management rights as well as as well as uh, as uh, as uh, royalty rights, which we didn't have and which uh, the federal government would refuse until we got the conservative leader, then Joe Clark to commit in writing as leader that if he became prime minister, he would treat us the, same, the oil the same as if it was on land. And uh, he was defeated and then Mulroney came in and Mulroney, to his everlasting credit, although I criticize him today for not standing up for the charter, uh, I, I'll select, you know, I, I'll give credit where credit is due and I'll give discredit where discredit is due. But on the uh, Atlantic Accord, uh, Mulroney stayed steadfast and without Brian Mulroney being Prime Minister, notwithstanding the fact that John Crosby was there, without Brian Mulroney being Prime Minister and Pat Kearney being Minister of Energy from British Columbia, we would never have gotten the Atlantic Accord. Remarkable. Thank you so much for that history, because I think it sets the stage well for you to tell us about another chapter in the drama that you that uh, you took part in, and that was having to deal with a, a different prime minister, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Now, I'd like to know your thinking as you were going into the, the charter discussions and the repatriation of the Constitution. I mean, it's, I think it's important that, to understand your perspective, having come from the, 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 the Newfoundlander uh, perspective of being a nationalist first and not necessarily getting the best deal out of Confederation. What, tell, how was that presented to you at the time? Just take us back in history about what, what caused Trudeau to believe that he had to repatriate at that time. Well, I think it wasn't just Trudeau thought we had to repatriate at the time. I think that's a myth. Yes, he wanted patriation, but so did a lot of others, okay? And I don't know if you remember, there was a number of uh, uh, federal provincial meetings before 81. After, after Diefenbaker did the Bill of Rights in 1960, which was a federal act and only applied to federal jurisdiction. Therefore, it didn't apply to all of the uh -huh. people of the country. This is very important. Diefenbaker is not given enough credit for that. And if you read that Bill of Rights, all of the same 
ideas are in there that are in the charter, as well as in the Bill of Rights of the United States of America. Okay. May I just say, with the exception of one, because I used to be a property rights advocate, and so I had the Bill of Rights on the wall, and it does actually mention the rights property in the original yeah. Bill of Rights, yeah. which does, is not included in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. True, couldn't get it in. Lahi tried, I tried, a number of times. Re remember now, the Bill of Rights is very unlike the Charter of Rights. The Bill of Rights was an act on its own in the federal parliament. So the prime minister could bring it in as a federal act without any negotiations with anybody, okay? It was a federal government initiative. That's important. Very important. Because now when I go and do all of these public meetings, which I've been doing for a year and a half, and explaining the, the charter, I had to explain the Constitution Act of 1982 because it's the Constitution of Act of 1982 in which the charter is located. Well, then let's start there. The charter, so the Constitution Act of 1982, why was that, so? What, the moment in time, why was it so important to do it then? Well, pr primarily because there was a feeling after the, uh, like I say, after 1960, between 1960 and 1981, there were a number of initiatives by different governments, federal and provincial, to get together to see whether we could do something about severing the last ties with England and amending our own, having our own constitution and being able to amend it here rather than have to go back to London. And at the same time, we were all familiar with the fact that the Bill of Rights was limited and never covered all individuals in Canada, okay? Okay, I like that. Now, hold on one second, if I can make sure that I understand this. What, what was the problem prior to 1982 when you say not have to go all the way to London? I'm just I guess we didn't have PDF and DocuSign back then, but did we no, literally no, but have the problem, to? <laughs> the, problem, the, the problem always was, and if you go back and look at the, uh, oh, let me see if I can get it right. The, uh, the federal minister guy, oh, uh, his name just escaped me, Robarts Commission. This, the, uh, the, um, his first name began with Elders. Um, yeah, I, I knew the guy too. He was, he, was, he was a very interesting fellow from Quebec. And he, anyway, there were a number of, uh, attempts to see if we could do something about patriating the constitution, but it got tied down with the amending formula. The amending formula for the future. If we patriated the constitution, how would it get amended? And that caused all kinds of problems for all kinds of provinces as well as the federal government. Okay, and take take me back so to 81 though, from, but, but let, let me ask you, like, would what if we hadn't patriated the constitution and we hadn't input, uh, brought through a bill of, uh, a charter of rights and freedoms? Well, then you're, really you're, well then you're up to the, uh, the, the vagaries of common law, British common law and mm -hmm. custom and convention from, 19, from 1867. That was the problem. Most people recognize, there's still some people around today who say the common law thing would be even better than having a written charter of rights and freedoms. I'm not one of those. I okay. was one of those, but I'm not anymore because the vagaries of, of law, as I've learned it over the years, by the way, everybody thinks I have a law degree and I say, no, I got my law degree by osmosis because I had two of the most brilliant people in my cabinet at the time who were lawyers. One who had a, a degree from the Sorbonne uh, uh, doctorate and, and from McGill and who did his honors in law sitting in the legislature of Newfoundland. That's how brilliant this guy was. And I had another guy who became my energy minister who became a, a court of appeal judge in Newfoundland and was recognized by everybody as being a brilliant lawyer. And they, I sat between them and the legislature oh. and in cabinet. And so I had, a, I, I was lucky that I, uh, these people supported me for the leadership and then, um, of course, we're in, in the cabinet because they were so competent. But in any case, so I, I come by it by by experience and being around really bright minds. Well, and also challenging uh, when the government and, seems and, to be going because, wrong. Because, because I was interested also, right? You have to be interested in something in order to be to, to become in well informed on it. Okay. And so what happened was the the amending formula always was the big boogaboo in trying to get a patriotic constitution. At the same time, we were all aware of the fact that the Bill of Rights didn't cover everybody. What an opportune time to bring both of them together into doing it in 1981. So this is how it sort of came about. It, it just didn't, it wasn't a birth then. It was an evolution of things that happened all the way through our history of being a common law, right? 
jurisdiction. Yes. And also then Diefenbaker doing his thing in 60, reinvigorating the debate on individual rights and freedoms. And then from there, up until 81, there were several attempts to do this, to do this patriation and to do this charter. All of them failed primarily because we never got out of the debate over an amending form where we couldn't get something that everybody agreed to. Now, may I just say, because the amending formula you came up with seemed quite elegant, if I remember it correctly, it's seven out of 10 provinces representing 50% of the population. And so it's funny because we know that, and it seems like it's not even really a stumbling block. I, I, I can only imagine the permutations you went to to get there, but do you think it's an appropriate uh, amending formula? Has it stood the test yes. of time in your opinion? I, Good. I, I, I think so. Okay. I think so. But, but I want you to understand, uh, now that you're, you're, you're really into it and, and uh, very few people have the time to, to do it in the way you and I are doing it right now, understand that there were other items on the table besides the charter and patriation, as important as they were. This is what the stumbling block is today with understanding the Constitution Act of 82. There was besides patriation and the charter, it was the amending formula, mm. okay? We had to agree if we're going to have our own constitution and no more amendments in London to how we were going to amend it in the future. So that had to be debated and agreed to. Natural resource development, especially renewable resources, Mr. Lougheed, Mr. Peckford, Mr. Blakeney, uh, Mr. Bennett, and to some extent, Mr. Lyon of Manitoba and Quebec, who up to that time hadn't said yes or no to what we were going to do. So you remember, so you had a lot of, and we were really scared of the federal government's intrusion into provincial jurisdiction. You remember, I don't have to tell you about Alberta and what the feds tried to do. So we were pretty scared even in 81 about this, okay? And I, we got even, more frightened because this is something that's not known very well either when i'll come to it in a second but with natural resources uh, minority language rights equalization renewal resources and the amending formula those were the five in addition to straight patriation and the charter Okay, we've got a lot to go through now, one at a time. So, so, so I think my, we've dealt with- my point, my point is, we don't have to go through them all. Well, my point is, it was a bargain based upon, it started at 20 items, oh. down to 12. And the last one I dropped for the sake of Canada was the fishery. Oh, really? I had fishery on the table to, to get a better sharing of powers between the two, recognizing that internationally and so on, the feds would have jurisdiction, but to get some say over when they made fisheries policy, can we be involved? And I dropped that for the sake of getting the deal. Nobody ever recognizes that as being important at all. But of course, you know, you know now from what you've already questioned me on as related to the fishery, how important and how difficult that was for me personally as well as for the government. I can like, imagine. Well, okay, so that's what a lot of people don't understand. And that's why when I do, uh, zooms just on the charter i say i need 40 minutes if you if you want me to present something to you it has to be at least 40 minutes and i want at least an hour to two hours for questions you know what i must say from what you've said i can see now because so many things that were so important to you you were willing to negotiate for the better deal i can see now why you feel so betrayed <laughs> by the aspects that everyone agreed on just being so blithely uh, ignored put off uh, on the side, acting as if they, uh, it, it, it essentially yes. doesn't exist. And this is constitution. This isn't a federal act or a provincial act. This exactly. is the constitution, the glue of our nation. This is supposed to be the place of permanent values, right? Of what we believe in as a nation and as a people. So yeah, uh, so, but I want you to really understand and I think you got, uh, this was a bargain. So we weren't just bargaining the charter, Right and 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 the patriation, right? The, the, but we had all of these other things on the table that people had to agree on in order for us to agree on the patriation and the charter. So let me go through. So we we've, we've talk, talked about patriation. We've talked about the amending formula. Is there anything more that I need to understand about 
natural resources? I mean, we understand it pretty well because we have the 1930s Resource Transfer Act as well, but is there anything more I need to understand about that clause? Only that the, if you go to, after this uh, interview is over, go back to the charter and look up the Constitution Act of 82, I mean, and go back and look up renewable resources in there and it strengthened the provincial's jurisdiction over natural resources. Uh -huh. Okay, well, that's good to know because I think we sometimes feel like we're still under attack on right. our natural resources. And, 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 and Lockheed and myself and Bennett and Blakeney in particular would not agree to that full package unless the natural resources was taken care of. All right, let me ask you about equalization because we might, I, I mean, I wonder if the deal with Churchill Falls that had been signed had not been so bad and Newfoundland and Labrador were able to stand on its own feet with its own source revenue. I wonder if there might have been a different outcome on the equalization discussion. Because I've said before, I don't have any problem with the principle of equalization that you want to have roughly equivalent programs for roughly equivalent tax rates across the country. But we now see, and now people are going to understand why I made you walk through that long history, Quebec gets... Uh, subsidized electricity rates, if they paid, and I think Danny Williams made this point, if they paid market value for their electricity, it would be almost equivalent to what they get in equalization. We've created a program that allows for a massive transfer of wealth into Quebec so that they can subsidize electricity, subsidize daycare, subsidize uh, post-secondary, mm -hmm. provide mm -hmm. better services than anywhere else, mm -hmm. and everybody else is just expected to pay. So that's what has created yeah. the And, and it's the, the formula. In the, in, the con in the Constitution Act of 82, it was just the principle of equalization. Yes. The formula is outside of it, which has changed every five years. So you may see, you may have seen that Alberta, uh, Albertans had a referendum where they said they wanted equalization yeah. out of the Constitution. They're so darn frustrated. Can right. you make an argument for a properly structured equalization program? Well, I just said the equalization is only in there in principle. The actual formulation of equalization formulas is outside the Constitution. You have to do it, but what the formulation is, is not constitutional. So Alberta might be a little bit off base in trying mm -hmm. to get equalization outside the constitution. It's better if they went and fought the provinces on the formula. That's do not- any gui Do you have some guidance for us? Because I have to tell you, I don't think any of the big provinces should be able to qualify for equalization. It's bananas that some of the small right. jurisdictions in certain years are transferring money to Quebec. Right. Quebec is right. twice yeah. the population of Alberta. Yeah. There's no question you need a whole reform of the equalization formula, okay? No question on what the basket of things that are going to be considered, right? There's no question about that. It has to be done. But it's not constitutional. You can, can you, do that without the without amending the Constitution. The well, Constitution well then Tell me if you can. Tell me what, what the debate was at the table at the time. What was, what was equalization supposed to be? Pardon? What was equalization supposed to be when you were debating what it at the time? What, what it is, we, we for, for all intents and purposes, except for a few wordings, it is under part three, I've got it here, without altering the legislative third uh, promoting equal opportunities and well-being for Canadians, furthering economic development to reduce disparity, providing essential public services of regional quality and all to all Canadians. And then Parliament and the government of Canada are committed to the principle of making equalization payments to ensure that provincial governments have sufficient revenues to provide reasonably comparable levels of public services at reasonably comparable levels of taxation. So you would say that principle is still sound, it's just been implemented badly. Exactly. Got it. Okay, um, anything I need to know about minority language rights? I know that's important to Quebec. No, okay. no not really. That it was obviously a deal breaker for Quebec, but for I mean, we have small um, indigenous populations yes. of, of French francophones in our right. province as well. But I, I don't know that it was uh, quite the burning yeah, issue Manitoba that it was for was Quebec. Great. Manitoba and New Brunswick were the two ones because they have, you know, one would cast away significant minorities of, of, of French speaking people, right, in Manitoba and in New Brunswick. So that's what really sort of mattered. And so we had to massage the wording on that, if you will, you know can we opt out or can we opt in? And that was a bit of a problem for a while on that. But otherwise, that's not a crucial one for us right now in our discussion. Okay, okay. so this is what I'm we, wondering. We're able, to, we're able to agree on the minority language rights. The big one was the uh, the the whole business of, of uh, what was going to be in the charter and what was going to be in the amending formula and how we were going to word equalization, how we were going to word 
renewable, even though minority language rights came down to be one of the last. Hmm. It was one that we all thought we could handle at the end of the day. The others, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to handle at the end of the day. Right? Well, where, like, when did the discussion of the charter come in? Because look at how we've handled it. We sort of said, well, there are all these issues. We've narrowed them down. We went through where we might have different agreements. And now it's OK, had, let's deal with the charter. The charter was dealt with largely before that crucial last three days. Okay. It was dealt with in the first 15 months. And why did um, uh, Trudeau Sr., why did he care so strongly about having a written charter of rights and freedoms? Or, or again, was that just because of the history we were talking about that yes, it began yes, in 1960? Yes, 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 exactly. But the other thing is, you remember, uh, and, and this is crucial now, I think we're at the point where I can introduce the following. 70 months of negotiations, the Prime Minister of Canada left the table and said, I can't deal with you guys anymore. You got 20 items on the table, we're down to 15 or whatever. We can't get a deal here. And therefore, I'm not, I'm not being part of this any longer. I can do this unilaterally. Now, this is the point where most Canadians have no idea whatsoever. And why this is so important to what is now in the chart. Tell me like, the timestamp on this. So you said okay. that you walked away from the table we one month. Away from the table in 1980-81. We took him and he said, I'm going to unilaterally do this. I don't need you guys. And so he passed a resolution in the House of Commons in 1980 saying that the federal government can unilaterally patriate the Constitution and include the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which had elements in it that affected the powers of the provinces. We took them to court. We, the prov 10 provinces split. Eight provinces opposed what he was doing. Well, really six first, and then finally it became eight, but eight overall. And two, New Brunswick and Ontario supported the federal government and said they can do this. So we took them to court and we decided we'd do it, not in all eight provinces, but in three provinces, Newfoundland, Quebec, and Manitoba. Hmm. And so court actions were initiated in all three of those courts of appeal against what the federal government was doing. They finally came to the Supreme Court for final decision on September the 28th, 1981. And Pierre Elliott Trudeau's friends, like I say, like to say in my annual meeting, my an, in my annual, in my public meetings around. At that point in 1981, you'll appreciate this. There were judges who were friends of the law more than they were friends of the prime minister. And they ruled against their friend, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, so-called scholar, and said, what you are trying to do is unconstitutional. So when- That's Fox so relevant. It is so relevant because it's not happening today. The court, the, the, I, I'm, it, I'm going it, to it, argue it, the courts are failing it, us. It, it's, it's relevant not only in that way, it's relevant in this way of what we did get afterwards. You see, right from day one, when the, the, the negotiations started, there were some provinces skeptical of the federal government on, on doing this. And, and they were brought along, if you will, and said, no, well, let's see how we get on. And things were, you know, intergovernmental affairs, ministers, premiers meeting over this, over those 17 months. And we thought we were making some progress. Well, those skeptics were right. He left the table. He not only he never just said, you know, we're going to have to speed this along, or I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't think we're getting here, or whatever. He actually up and left the table, and not only left the table, introduced legislation which was completely antithetical to what Canada is. Okay, and tried to make it work, tried to push it through. So it was not just leaving the table. What he did after was actually initiating that kind of action through the House of Commons and trying to make it stick that really stuck in our cross. So we knew we couldn't trust the federal government. That's why when people talk about the charter, it has to be put into context. We just came through a few months before that, a prime minister who didn't even believe that the provinces had any power anymore. We came to a prime minister who broke his word that he would stay at the table. And he actually initiated the legislation to, to stop us from having the powers we knew we had and that he couldn't do without uh, you know, talking to the provinces and getting the provinces on side. So that's why that notwithstanding clause was in there. 
So who was the notwithstanding clause in there for? Was that in? Because it, it, help me understand this as well, because I guess that's the argument that could be made is that because there was the escape hatch of, yeah, we recognize all these rights and they're sacrosanct, but we can always override them if we want to. No, I want to talk about that. Do. The intent of section one was to be used only in war, insurrection, or peril to the state. It wasn't to be used in this particular pandemic context where a manufactured emergency arose. This was not, so it's not even relevant, okay? Not even relevant. Now, some people said, well, why didn't you put it in there? Well, we thought it was self-evident at the time because it was in the constitution. That, that's what it would mean. How could you take away rights we were just giving in writing to every Canadian unless it was really a peril to the state? But if you go to 4.1 of that, or section one, just go down to section four, we put in a section there which said, uh, perhaps we can also allow a parliament or a legislative assembly to go beyond five years if we're in a serious situation. And what did they describe as serious situation? Insurrection and war, actually in the clause. Is that a fact? So the so notwithstanding our clause- mindset, was... Our mindset, not, no, this is not the notwithstanding clause. This oh, is this section is section one. one. Okay, so section- Do you have the wording in front of you? I wonder if I yes. should pull that up. Why don't you read yes. the wording for those who are not as familiar with it? Because that's the one where it says, that reasonably demonstrable in a free and democratic society or some such language, yes. right? But, but, but what I go on to argue, Danielle, is that I'm a fair person. Okay, let's for argument say, say it applies. Let's for argument say, say it applies. I was there, unfortunately, I'm the only one still alive who was there as a first minister. And I remember well that it was meant to be in a very, very you know, perilous situation for the state that you could override, okay? I'm the only one. So I'm alone saying that, right? And people can say, well, you can say what you like now, all the rest of them are dead. They can't disagree with you, right? They can use that kind of silly argument. So I go on to say, before I come to section four again, okay, I go on to say, okay, I'll take you on. It does apply for argument's sake. You have four tests to me. And any plain reading of that section is you have to demonstrably justify what you're doing. And I remember when we put demonstrably in there, we only justified the original thing before we finalized it. And Lahid and myself and others argued for demonstrably, right? To make it stronger. Tell me what, what that, what it legally, what would demonstrably mean? What, what were you in hoping policy, that would do? In terms in Canada, that would mean a cost benefit analysis. Huh. Demonstrably justified. Now, okay, reasonable limits by law. And I would argue that went because of the unusual nature of this, it would have to be a new law, not using existing laws. So I think this is where all the problems in the federal government are going wrong right now because they're using existing law. But the catcher, the two big ones, are demonstrably justified, and that's the main verb in that whole sentence there. The main verb, main predicate, or whatever you if you know your English, is demonstrably justified. A lot of lawyers have always you said the reasonable limits clause, and I argue with every lawyer who says reasonable limits clause. This is not a reasonable limits clause. This is a demonstrably justified clause. Let me read the exact wording so people know why you're making such a stark distinction. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So demonstrably justified, you say, is the crucial two words in that, in that entire clause. Exactly. And the rest are, are objects of the preposition or, uh, or adverbs or whatever. The verbs, the verb, the active, right? Remember in your English grammar? The, the, the verb, the active part of the, of the sentence is demonstrably justified. And in your discussions on that, you mentioned cost-benefit analysis. You have to be able to provide some proof that what you're doing is right. going to yield more benefit than cost. Or and we, and we know from history, long before I was premier in 79, that we all used, governments did use, when we were introducing new legislation, or new things, you had to justify why you were doing it. And very often you did a cost benefit analysis. It was part of me when I was premier, I remember we did it. So that's not an, un, an, an unusual way to bring meaning to demonstrably justify. Isn't it view. so interesting? And yet with the passage of time, 
we never do cost benefit analyses on anything. And so I guess people have sort of forgotten what was being referred to there. Well, yeah, but in some jurisdictions, they still do it. But the other point of it all is, Danielle, is all of those other three tests demonstrably justified by law in, with reasonable limits have to be done how? Within the context of a free and democratic society. And here's the catcher that I think even the courts, when we're all finished with this, are going to rule in my favor. I'm still holding out hope that we're going to rule in our favor because none of the 14 governments have either done a cost benefit analysis or did they involve their parliaments oh, yes. to be a free and democratic society? What does that mean? In our terms, that's a parliamentary democracy. What does that mean? That means having a parliamentary committee that perhaps could oversee with the minister what they're implementing. Perhaps do the cost benefit analysis. Perhaps call in all of the scientists, not just the public health official who had a biased view on the science, but bring in everybody. So I think if I could get before the court and or have this interview before the court explaining what section one meant, both its intent, and even if you want to argue that it still applies, that those four tests have not been met in the present circumstance. And therefore what all of the governments are doing is unconstitutional and violates the charter. Well, you so it's sort of interesting to hear you lay it out that way because we saw very um, uh, it, sort of in living color what happens when that principle is applied the way the legislation prescribes when they tried to invoke the Emergencies Act. So it got invoked the, by upon declaration, but then it had to be debated and passed in the House of Commons, and it had to be debated and passed in the Senate. And when it, my presumption is that when it looked like it wasn't going to pass in the Senate, because they were asking the exact same questions you are, is where's the proof that this is demonstrably justified? It didn't rise to that occasion. So that's the reason why you need to be able to have the free open hallelujah. debate. Okay. Ha hallelujah. I, I do think in the, in the emergency thing, it was partly the Senate, but I think it was also partly the investment community. But nevertheless, the Senate did delay and caused the government a lot of consternation before they were even going to get around to a vote. You just can't ignore. I'm not finished yet. I got two other things to say about this, about this. Charity. About section one still? Because I want to no. get to section 33 as well, because I want to, well, I'll tell you why I keep going back to that one, because I've all, I think some people might depict that notwithstanding clauses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We said all of these nice things, but we reserve the right to override it. And so I want to understand uh, the conversation that took place around 33. Well, yeah, well, I'll come to 33. But before that, I just want to say, like, to finish off on section one there, that free and democratic society, you can't get around that. The judges can't get around that. They've been allowed to get around it up to now, like the, the decision out of BC. Remember, they're still at the lower courts. Mm -hmm. None of the courts of appeal have heard the charter arguments yet, nor has the Supreme Court of Canada. So we got a ways to go yet. As I say to people, we may be in the second period and maybe getting near the end of the second period, but we got all the third period to go yet. And okay. I say that to lawyers like, uh, like the guy from Queen's University, who, who's, who laments that, oh, it might be all over. Um, what's his name? I, I always, uh, I shouldn't forget his name. Uh, I'm thinking Bruce Party is one yes, of the- Bruce Party. Yes, Bruce yes. Bruce is saying that. And, and he put a couple of pieces in the uh, uh, National Post. I put some rebuttals in, National Post wouldn't carry them. The national, the national media has uh, completely eliminated me from the discussion for the last year and a half. All of the media. And they won't, they won't listen to what I have to say. And I was commending Mr. Party in that, except that I thought he was too gloomy, that how can you as a law professor say it's all over when none of the courts of appeal have heard it? I thought that was a pretty good argument. Unless I'm not there's- being, I'm, not, I'm not being provocative. Unless there's an argument that COVID will be over and the restrictions will be gone by the time you get- No difference, the act, the act of, of, of violation still occurred, regardless of whether it's over 10, 15 months in, there were, there, were there were 12 months when the act was violated, when the charter was violated. So it has nothing to do with time. Time and, 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 and violation are two different things, right? If you violated it today, you violate it. Doesn't make any difference whether it was taken off tomorrow. Right? Well, and, regar 
And and to your point, I mean, it just recently, we I, I think uh, Black Locks has reported that the government has relented. They're not going to have a vaccination mandate for cross-border truckers going from one province yeah. to another. But we still have these vax mandates. They're, they're still violating the charter. Still violating the charter. Still violating the charter. Correct. And um, you can't leave. You can't get on a plane and fly. Exactly. You can't drive across the border. So your mobility rights, Section 6, those are right. still violated. A so absolutely. Totally, totally, totally. Okay, so, so let's talk about... So I don't think the courts can get around all of this at the end of the day. And I think it'll, it'll take some really good lawyers, but if they argue the way I'm arguing, I think we can persuade uh, the courts to, to say that all of this was a violation. How, how they're going to work out the accountability for all these people is another matter. But the, on a point of law, this was a violation of the charter. Now, I want to say two things before we get into 33. Okay. I want to talk about 52, which is... Constitution of this country is the supreme law of Canada, of this country. Very few people mention that anymore. It's part of the Constitution Act of 1982. In other words, when people talk to me about, oh, my council is going to lay me off because of this bylaw under the pandemic, or, or the province is going to right, lay me off or bring in these mandates, they're all subject to the charter. The charter is the supreme law of Canada. That's in the Constitution too. Now, here is, I go even higher in my argument in this sense. What are the opening words of the charter? Not section one. I'm scrolling back to see if I can find them here. Whereas want, Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And what kind of a grammatical notation is after it? A colon good so my argument to the judges and to canada is this the charter has to be interpreted under the principles of the supremacy of god and the rule of law and all of the courts since 1982 quite likely have violated that charter because they have not in the rendering of their judgments paid due deference to and define what supremacy of God means and what rule of law means. Well, then you're going to have to educate us because so much of religion has been taken out of the public dialogue and we've become and so what, secularized. So what did you mean when you said supremacy, supremacy of God? Supremacy of God meant, of course, like in the United States, inalienable rights. That it's not given by government, that the rights are endowed upon you by the creator. Understood. What about the, what about the rule of law? Rule of law. There are some judges who have talked about that. And that is the rule of law means a lot of permanence, right? But a lot of things are very permanent and they can't be changed easily, right? So that, that's a warning before you start to get into this charter, judge, that you have to have that principle of the rule of law in your mind all the time as you're trying to render these judgments. And they've, there have been a couple of judges and a few of the things have actually mentioned the rule of law, but then they go on to sort of almost discard it again. My argument is that now in its totality that we've just talked about, and we can get into, the, I can talk about 33, but in its totality, words matter because that's what the constitution is worth. And they all matter including the preamble, which enunciates those two very big principles of our culture, of our history, if not our present. I say to people now who are religious and say, you know, uh, I want to reopen the Constitution. I said, beware what you're asking for, because given the secular nature of our, our world right now, that, that supremacy of God is likely not to last very much longer it, if you open the Constitution. And you I know that. I think you're quite right. Okay, so now I'm, I hate to start. I, I know I felt like I've been rushing you along to this one because I feel I, I feel like this is one of the, this is the yes, but clause. It's sort of how I've looked at it. It says ex exception where express declaration. So 33-1, parliament or the legislature of a province may expressly declare in an act of parliament or of the legislature, as the case may be, that the act or provision thereof shall operate notwithstanding a provision included in section two. Those are where the fundamental freedoms are articulated right, right. and section seven through 15 of the charter. We may have to do a bit of a review about the ones that are not included in there. But, but first, before we talk about 
I don't know. Would you tell me which order we should go in? Why Why were those particular sections? One we that... were scared of the federal government, as I told you earlier, because Trudeau leaves the table and all the rest of it. And in my case, for example, we had examples in Newfoundland where a manpower program came in, which was to train people in various trades, and they deliberately left out fish plant workers oh. and quality control. We, for some reason, were not, uh, even though the courses were in the trade schools and in the vocation schools of Newfoundland, and were of equal quality academically in every other way as that of any other province, they were excluded. If I hadn't been minister at the time, I think, or was I premier? I might've been premier at the time. I actually jumped aboard a plane and went up and waited until Lloyd Axworthy would see me, which he tried not to for three or four days. And I turned up at his office Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I found out he was gonna be in the office at 10 o'clock through some whistleblowers. And I accosted him and got him to change it right there in his office and flew home with, with it in my pocket. But my point is, is that the federal government from time to time, because of their intrusions now into all areas of provincial jurisdiction, we did not feel comfortable with, with having nothing in that constitution which protected us if they were going to do these massive intrusions. And my good, my example, for you today is that manpower training one, which was very important in Newfoundland. We never had the money to, to carry that program out for very long, okay? Isn't and that we interesting? Because we were that's... being discriminated against. Well, and I understand that. So that changed the context, but the way it's been used in practice, when you look at Quebec, it's basically to override the English language minority rights of their population. Right. So it's not it's not uh, to prevent some sort of federal intrusion, which they've been pretty good at at negotiating around. Yes. But it has I, been to to give them a free I, I, license I, 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 to, I to to discriminate. But, but, well, remember we live in a, we don't live in a perfect world, and we're going to have right. It's going to it's going to be right. There's going to be exceptions to the rule, but that was what was intended at the time it was written for those kinds of situations where the federal government was intruding upon provincial jurisdiction, and therefore we had an, an out. But remember, though, we had to go to the parliament and get it approved by our own legislature, and it could only last for five years. It wasn't permanent and had to be renewed again for the next five years. So it has some safeguards in there, right? That it, could, it had to be a majority in the legislature got to agree, and it could only last for five years. Do so you that, think- That was the, that was the uh, what, what shall I say? That was the- uh, that was the ones that the parts of it that we gave away, we being the ones who wanted the notwithstanding clause. We were willing to say, okay, first of all, it was going to be, you know, for a long time. But we agreed in the negotiations in order to get the full deal that we would agree that, okay, it had to go through the legislature and it could only be for five years and then had to be renewed. So that was our huh. concessions on notwithstanding clause. Did you anticipate it being used the way it's been used in Quebec? I think most recently about no. this religious symbols law as well, no, which- No, which, and I, I don't, did, they, did it get to the Supreme Court afterwards? Did it get to the Supreme Court of Canada? I don't think it's gone there yet. I know that there, because in, in Calgary- I don't think that will last at the Supreme Court. You don't think Court. it will? Interesting. No. I know there's been interventions from different uh, politicians. I think Patrick Brown yes. uh, at the municipal yes. level is intervening as is Jody Gondek yes. in, in Calgary. So, yes. and there are yes. others. But you our wouldn't... problem is our problem is like everybody's frustrated because okay they're being, like in now in the pandemic thing and my the charter rights you know and the courts are not a, the, the problem is it takes so darn long to get through the courts that people are frustrated right and the pandemic will be over and and they say well you know uh, my problem my problem fundamentally is is that if we don't restore my meaning and that, that a lot of other people agree with me on my meaning of the Constitution, so I described it here at length to you today, then our democracy is diminished. And the next time around, when you or me, five years from now, or friends of ours, or just a Canadian goes to court and says, I want to challenge this, what happened to me, under the charter, the first thing the lawyer is going to say to them, well, we may have a problem here, because since the charter was done, and though it was in effect for 40 years, there was this pandemic five years ago, and uh, the, uh, the government's brought in all these measures, and um, the courts are ruled uh, in favor of the government, and so there's a precedent now, and so we're going to have the, the, the courts are going to use this precedent, and it diminishes the power of the charter, 
and therefore our democracy has been diminished. If we do have anything close to a, a democracy based upon individual rights and freedoms at all. So it has to be challenged. I get, I get your point. It's like that living tree doc, doctrine. And if this living tree- to, oh, I'm so glad you brought it. Nobody brings that up only, I, I don't know of anybody now out of the 70 or 80 interviews I did brought up the living tree. That came into existence back about 40 or 50 years ago and has become the darling of law schools and to the detriment of the church. Because what they're saying is the law changes over time without even amending the constitution, right? The constitution changes over time without being amended. And that is so dangerous. Robert Bork wrote about that. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Bork in the United States. There's his book, Coercing Virtue. Uh, he, was a, he, was a, he, he was nominated for the Supreme Court and the Democrats turned him down. Hmm. And he never got the Supreme Court. But this is a brilliant book. If you ever wanna know anything about living tree and how the courts are now legislating, not just interpreting, this is the book. And it's only 190 pages long, beautiful book. One of the most best cogently argued stuff as relates to the living tree that you're ever gonna see, okay? I, I have it here all the time. I, I almost go to bed with it. <laughs> would you, but would, could you make the argument that if the court does override the elected parliaments, are they, are they being true to the principles of the charter or are they writing their own law? They're writing their own law. So what about in this circumstance when you're trying to, to get them to challenge vaccine mandates and vaccine edicts and vaccine passports? And I mean, yeah, the, 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 it's written. I mean, uh, SM, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, life, liberty, and the person, right? And the security of the person, right? Equality before the law. They, they all have to be upheld. They all have to be upheld. You're not breaking, okay. yeah. Let me talk about a couple of things, because what I found interesting about the notwithstanding clause is it didn't apply to everything. So we talked about the fundamental right. freedoms, uh, freedom of conscience and religion, thought, belief, opinion, expression, freedom of the press and other media of communication, freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association. Um, we also have that at uh, so section seven is life, liberty, security, the person. Uh, right again, it could be used to override search, search and seizure rights, detention or imprisonment. Uh, proceedings right. in a criminal and penal matters, uh, right. treatment and punishment, self-incrimination, interpreter and equality right. rights. Well, like, why did you limit the notwithstanding clause to apply to only those areas? Because it's really important why section six was not uh, identified as an area that could be right. Uh, right. used. So, we, so tell me, explain that if you wouldn't well, mind. I can only explain it that we thought at the time these were the areas that would be most affected in mm -hmm. our jurisdictions. That's the answer to that. It's very simple. Not, not complicated. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, but, but that's where we were most concerned, our delegations, uh, that would be BC, Alberta, uh, um, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and PEI, particularly. They, they, we were the ones who were strongest about this, right? It's so and interesting we, to think yeah. that the, the whole purpose behind that was to prevent federal interference in provincial jurisdiction. I get it now. <laughs> So talk but, but to me about, yeah, go ahead. But especially, but especially, I want your viewers to know, especially because of what Trudeau did himself. If he had not walked away from the table, that would not set the standing clause would be a lot weaker. All right. Let me you ask you, I, I get it. Let me ask you about mobility rights. Section six, because this is the one that drives me bananas. Every citizen of Canada has the right to enter, remain in, and leave Canada that's, po that's point one. Point two, right to move and gain livelihood. Every citizen of Canada and every person who has the status of a permanent resident of Canada has the right to move and take up residence in any province, to pursue the gaining of a livelihood in any province. And then you've got a limitation, the right specific to that are subject to any laws or practices of general application in force in a province other than those that discriminate among persons, primarily right. on the basis of province of present, or previous residents and any laws providing the reasonable residency requirements as a qualification for the receipt of publicly provided social services. You know, I read that and I think there's there's no way my unvaccinated friends should be prohibited from boarding a plane to enter or leave Canada. Or that's, should be why, that's why that's the one I'm taking to court. I'm taking federal court on that one. So tell me, tell me what the basis of um of what was that supposed to mean? I mean, it sounds so straightforward, and yet here we are in a position where, where people are trapped inside their country. 
Exactly. And, and I think everybody has that same frustration as I do and you do. There's no question. I'm unvaccinated and I should be able to travel anywhere in the country uh, because of that uh, the provision. And the, and the federal government has taken it away from me. The reason why I used it in my lawsuit is because it does apply to all Canadians. And I thought uh, because uh, of my, my stature here, as it relates to being the last first minister, that if I'm going to walk the walk and just not talk the talk, this is the one I should use, right? Because everybody can relate to it quite easily. There's a lot of provincial mandates that can get messy and it, it takes three steps to get the Supreme Court of Canada. This will only take two steps and it's a uh, general application across the nation. So I thought it was a good one to do. Besides which I agree with you that it's just so, when you read that, it's so fundamentally common sense and, and reasonable and sensible that, um, you know, we. And the federal government, by the way, we think made a really big mistake here because they used the Aeronautics Act. Uh, it's under the Aeronautics Act that they did this. And the Aeronautics Act has to do with the safety of planes. Interesting. So there, there, there'd be so no reason. So we think reason. that they result are virus that, that all together. Uh, and, then, and, and then we enter, then we enter the section six into the argument as well. I feel like I'm asking you a personal question, but you have said that you are unvaccinated. So um, are you, are you unvaccinated just because you, you want to show solidarity with those no, who are also, no. you want to share because why you're unvaccinated? It's, it's, it's a, yeah, because of the science, because as I start reading it, my wife and I start getting into it. We, we came across a whole bunch of uh, information. One was, the big, the big one early on was the fact that I'm going to uh, subject myself to a product for which the creator will not stand behind. Whew. Do I go buy a car without a warranty? Do I do I buy anything today without warranties? You mean to tell me that you're going to do something with my health, but you're not going to be held liable if anything goes wrong? Couldn't couldn't agree to that. That was that was the thing. Then we started to look at um, studies on vitamin D, and we found out that of course vitamin D and all the studies that have been done on infectious diseases, including COVID, that if you have the right levels of vitamin D and most Canadians don't because live in the northern climate. Uh, your rate of hospitalization and the seriousness of that illness, if you do get it, is very much diminished. And why aren't they arguing? Why aren't they promoting in these press conferences vitamin D, let alone a zinc or a tercin or, uh, or a vitamin C, which is sort of the, the cocktail for, right, Pro, pre getting anything. But why aren't they doing it? And that sounded very strange. So the more we looked at it, the more we had more questions we had. And then Dr. Hoff came along and copper fastened for me. You know, when we started getting the College of Physicians and Surgeons in, in, the, in British Columbia accusing somebody of, of COVID hesitancy and that somehow that was a crime. I couldn't find it in the criminal code and I don't think anybody else can. Well, why is a doctor who had spent 25 years, right, practicing to First Nations in Lytton, BC, suddenly being uh, discriminated against because he had some questions and some skeptical, some questions about the virus, especially of the vaccine, especially these questions came up after he had nine people who were his patients and who were inoculated by another doctor for COVID suddenly come down with these weird neurological and other physiological and other disease uh, ailments. And because he was just an MD, he asked for the doctors in Kamloops who were specialists, some of the specialists there at the regional hospital to look at them and they refused to. And so I was on the Dr. Hoff, like, a, you know, I was still, I had my blog going at the time. And I got on Dr. Hoff just to, to confirm everything that I had heard because I didn't know if it was true. So please tell me if this is true. And he went through it in chapter and verse with me on the phone. And then I put it on my blog and got some good, you know, thousands of people all over the world and then started being interviewed. And then I tried to get, get some from a newspaper that carried the story for a day and a half. And we're told to take it down. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, something really strange is going on here. So these were the things that led us to be in this position, even though we had been vaccinated for everything else since we were born. But this particular one, and then when we, of course, experimental, it had not gone through the proper trials like other 
vaccines had. And then later on, we even became stronger because we found out that the injuries in this from these vaccines, the four of them or five of them, however many, the total number of deaths and injuries were greater than all of the vaccines together over the last 30 years and had that verified by doctors. So I started calling people and uh, getting more information, getting more studies. So that's, that's how we came at it. Do you find it fascinating that um, your opinion has been valued on all of the other issues that we've talked about up until this point, and yet your views cannot be yeah. published in mainstream uh, media? Exactly. And the Times columnists used to carry my views because I would be writing, you know, with things that came up. I'm, I'm still active. And, you know, I, I'm that kind of a person. And so I would write a letter and they would carry it. And people would call me and say, thanks for that letter in the paper, Mr. Becker. That gives another perspective. I'm still so grateful you're still active, you know, and giving that other perspective, whether I agree with you or not. And they were doing that regularly when the National Post had already closed me down. Hmm. And then gradually, as we got into the pandemic, suddenly I sent some letters down, which were more negative uh, and, you know, questioning. And then they, they closed me down. And even, you know, with the, uh, Jordan Peterson couldn't believe when I did the interview with him. He said, that's funny because he said, I just had two. And I said, Jordan, I'll make a guess. You know somebody. Because, oh, I see. Jordan Peterson is getting published, but you're not. He was getting published that same week and i actually wrote a letter to the national post commending mr peterson on his short article but talking about certain things in the charter which he had left out so it was a very balanced one as were all of the ones i had done months and months before that all of which never even got acknowledged i will i hope at some point as you get your way through the litigation, that you come up with some answers as to why that is, because that's been a bit of a mystery to me. But let me circle back, if we can go full circle, to the 1960 Bill of Rights, because I'm, I'm wondering if the omission of the right to property is one of the reasons why governments feel they can do this. They can take your business, shut down your business. They've I taken churches, they can shut down, they can shut down your livelihood. Is I it that there is I'll just I'll just say because one of the things that I've that I've heard argued, and then you can tell me how it was argued at the table, is that the charter does not recognize economic rights, economic yeah. liberty, because it took property out of it. What was the I, actual discussion that took place at the time? No, no. By the way, I wanted it in there. Lougheed wanted it in there. We lost that battle. Do you know why, though? Like, what was the argument against? Well, well, I don't know. I don't remember now what the argument was against it, but I mean, it was, we fought that for the whole 17 months. Hmm. And the most vocal advocate, I, I guess if you could say most, although I, I was, and so was Peter Lougheed, and so was Bill Bennett, to their credit, and even the uh, even, uh, new, new Democrat, uh, Alan Blakeney, uh, but the most vocal for its inclusion, if you can pick out one, would be Sterling Lyon of Manitoba. This man has never been given the credit that he's due, as Stephen Baker hasn't for the Bill of Rights. Sterling Lyon told us, if you will, not say told us, but he was, you know, he was one of the, the group of eight. He told us on a number of occasions that what's happening today would happen. Really? Well, why, why did he say that? How he did he know? He was so strong on that property right thing. Yes. He's making the argument that you're making today. That if it's excluded, the politicians will think yeah. it's excluded for a reason. If it's yeah. not there, because it goes back to, we yeah. grant you rights, therefore yeah. we have yeah. not granted yeah. you those rights. They've yeah. forgotten yeah. what the preamble yeah. said. Although I think it's overridden by the two, six, seven, and 15 myself. And I think we will be, be successful. But yes, you do have a point. I don't think it's to the point to override all of these other two, six, seven, and 15 at the end of the day when it gets to the Supreme Court, but I do accept your point. So tell me where it goes from here. We want to watch what's happening uh, in well, the, as the litigation. The yeah. We've got to watch the ones that are going on in the provinces too. Um, and there's a couple going on in the province, I think that JCCF are involved in, where the, the public health officer has the government has refused to provide the information that they say they had from the start and was the reason why they brought in the, the mandates, but they won't supply it. So there's a, a great 
reluctance by the governments. Uh, I don't know if at the end of the day they think they can wait this out somehow or another, but uh, they can't. There is a class action suit going on in British Columbia by a group where their governments are doing exactly the same thing, which I helped finance with a lot of other Canadians who have won the first uh, legal suits on the pandemic to be tabled in Canada. And uh, the Society for the Advancement of Science and Public Policy or whatever, something like that. And this is a group of people who got together and, and they're before the courts right now. So we got to watch these, these as they go up to the courts of appeal. May I ask you? It'll be would it... very interesting, the courts of appeal and just how, how many judges they have looking at it and what those decisions are. Do, do you think that it would pass muster on section one when we're talking about uh, demonstrably justified if they come back and said, well, everyone else was doing it, so we would too? I mean, is that going to be, because that seems there's a lot of me tooism that happened. Uh, yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I don't think they're going to get away with it at the Courts of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada. And I, I'm glad it's gone on this long now, because I think the, the, the judges can be influenced just as much as the politicians can. And uh, it, to, to, to uh, defray them from the living tree good doctrine, which all of them are contaminated with, right? I think the, the longer this even goes with the courts, the better chance we have of winning. Because I think both on the science side and on the law side, as this kind of explanation gets out, the, the judges are going to have, especially the appeal court judges, have some box. I think the judge in Ontario who ruled on the parents' rights a couple of days ago is a really good indication of somebody starting to look at the science a bit closer and saying, e, this is not settled. I'm sorry, but there's a lot of stuff here. I read this, this decision, a lot of stuff here that makes an awful lot of sense to me, which you can't counteract with your original narrative. And, uh, you know, that parent has some rights here and I'm not prepared to go. I'm not prepared to, to, to join in right now. And that's a tiny crack, it's the tiniest of cracks, but I think it does allow other judges now in other provinces, because guess what? Within two hours of that being decision being delivered, all of the courts in Canada were reading this. Hmm. So it's like, it's like I say to people, the prime minister every morning he gets up, knows what's going on in Tofino and Bonavista, right? Because <laughs> he has the population of all of the newspapers and somebody giving him his his, his reading material before he has his first coffee. Let me ask you this, because people will be watching this wondering, what can I do? What can people do? What are you telling people to do? Or is it patience? Is it, is it uh, I mean, do you ultimately believe that the legal process is what needs to, to happen? Or do you have some other recommendation for people? There's a lot of, you know, I, I, I call it a, almost a collective trauma for those for those who had their, their their rights violated more than others, there there is a collective trauma. There's a lot of anger. Um, I keep hearing people wanting to say we need to hold someone accountable. Is it is it enough that we get a precedent so this doesn't happen again, or do you have any other sort of objectives you're trying well, to achieve? You know, uh, no, I, I want that. I want that the, the, those provisions of the charter restored to their proper place, and that has to go through the courts. But I do think that the more people uh, like. There's rallies every almost every Saturday in Victoria. I don't know of any other capitals, but I think they're certainly having them in uh, in Calgary and I think Edmonton as well. I oh, almost good. all the I time think I they see should join those because th those influence both politicians and the courts. Keep doing those civil disobedience within the law. Keep doing those. So they're very very important and they will have an influence. Action for Canada. Take action, Canada. Um, um, taking back our freedoms, of which I'm chairman group out of Alberta, started out of Alberta. All of these groups are very important because they're influencing and they're, they're sending out representations to the, the politicians every day, right? So I think all of those organizations that are now active in all of the provinces of Canada are very important for you to join, very important for you to write a letter to your MP and your MLA, not an email. Email is easily deleted. Oh my, I forgot. The secretary tells this poor citizen, well, well, you know, I wrote your minister, I wrote your MLA. Oh, I'm sorry, I think that must. But if you put something in writing and you put it in the snail mail, it goes to a post office box. It has to be picked up. The mail has to be open and it's put in a pile and it's recorded in the minister's office or the prime minister's office. And I think a snail mail still has more impact than an email.
And so okay. I would recommend to everybody, write your letters, keep writing them in snail mail, notwithstanding that we're in 2022, right? Snail mail is just still very important, as is Aristotle and Plato. So don't give me the technical time of what we're in. People should know that you used to be a school teacher, and it's very obvious in the way that uh, you've been educating me along the way here, and I appreciate that. Before I leave this, I want to sort of connect it back to the mission of the Fraser Institute, because the Fraser Institute does talk about free enterprise, free uh, entrepreneurship, and I'm wondering what, what sort of potential long-term damage do you think is the recent actions might have caused Canada? You made an, a reference to it earlier um, because I said, well, the Senate clearly was not going to, to affirm the Emergencies Act, but you said you thought that the investment community had something to say about that as well. And that's what I'm gravely fearful of is that can politicians so rattle the investment climate and our confidence in investment and our confidence in how markets work and our ability to do capital formation and start businesses because there's so much uncertainty about how they're going to treat us in the future. I'm, I'm wondering if you can shed some light on that. My experience, uh, and uh, not only as Premier, but as Minister of Mines and Energy in Newfoundland, and having a very, very intimate involvement with the oil and gas industry in particular, but other industries as well, forest industry big, and the, iron, and the mineral business. I was involved in all three in a big, big way, not only, na not only provincially, but nationally. OK, uh, and because my my views were sought and I provided them and uh, and since I got out of politics as well, I can say with the utmost confidence that what has happened in the last while and especially the Emergency Act, but also the Charter, there are lawyers in in, in Mobile, you know, and, and Exxon and in Chevron. I, I knew all of these. I knew all of these international presidents and international executive vice presidents very well. Some of them became friends of mine. OK after they retired, same way in force, same way in mining. So I speak with a lot of experience, not only as an elected politician, but as a consultant who consulted for people all over, all every province of Canada and in Western Europe and in the United States. I have experience on business and on politics. There is no question that what happened in the last two years gravely affects the investment climate of this country. And there are people who have made decisions in the last several months to not invest in Canada mm. because of what we have been doing. There's and when you talk about, when you talk one, about of the, one of the most startling things that I learned the hard way was in dealing with corporations, especially international corporations who had an interest in Canada, a big interest in Canada, was this, that they knew a lot more than we gave them credit for. And especially their accountants and their lawyers and their advisors. I was flabbergasted to know that a lawyer sitting in New York with Mobile knew about the fish plant in St. Anthony, Newfoundland. I'm telling you, it, they, they do their homework. And uh, when sometimes, when you hear them speak, you hear the CEO speaks, uh, I know where that statement came from and what engendered that statement, because I can hear the accountant and the lawyer and some of the vice presidents saying that to the president. Well, you just, it matters. And it, you've just underscored why you need to do the cost benefit analysis before the fact, because there's going to be a reckoning after the fact, and we'll be feeling this for a long time is what I'm hearing you tell us. Absolutely no question. And remember, and I don't know why other premiers, uh, former premiers and so on, don't talk about this more, Provinces borrow on the international markets. I borrowed in Frankfurt, I borrowed in Zurich, and I borrowed in Paris and London and right New York and Japan. We actually borrowed in Japan one year. Provinces, sub-sovereign states can borrow. And uh, so a lot of premiers, not, uh, at least I did, I didn't leave it to my Minister of Finance. I got involved myself as well with the Minister of Finance. And I met a lot of these bankers in Frankfurt and London, and Paris and Zurich over a 10 year period. And I know how they think. And that should, you know, I, I, it boggles my mind when some of the things that Trudeau and even some of the conservatives have said over the last number of years about the economy and, you know, how it works and so on. They're, they're, they're very deficient in, in their knowledge base of what really makes a capitalist economy work. 
I think they've come to the conclusion and convinced themselves all they need to do is just crank up the money oh. printing machine and, and everybody can win. Brian Packard, Absolutely. it's been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. I sure appreciate it. Good talking to you too. We had a good one. That was Brian Peckford, the former Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador from 1979 to 1989. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you stream your podcasts. And to stream old episodes, learn more about the show, and where to subscribe and submit your questions for future guests, visit fraserforum.org. 